welcome to Playing for Keeps with Bob Kohler and myself, Adam Erickson. For one hour a week, we want to engage you in creative thinking on the most pressing subject of our time, building a lasting, sustainable, global peace. If you are interested in fostering that kind of peace in your life and in our world, then you want to play for keeps with us. This is serious business, but at Playing for Keeps, we realize that taking ourselves too seriously can undermine our goal. A world at peace will certainly be a joyful and playful place. So while we are bringing you our features and interviews with people making a difference for peace, we'll try to do it with a playful touch. Playing for Keeps is a project of the Raven Foundation where I am education director. At Raven we offer blogs, vlogs, arts and entertainment reviews, and events all focused on raising awareness about building global peace. So please check us out at ravenfoundation.org. I would like to introduce you to my good friend Bob. Bob is an award-winning journalist who writes a weekly column for his website Common Wonders and for the Huffington Post. Bob describes himself as a peace journalist, and we'll explore that title in a minute. But Bob, I want to ask you about a story you tell on your website. You say it was a life-changing event for you, and I think it describes really well what we are trying to do here at Playing for Keeps. You were 11 years old and you got into a fight. Can you tell us a bit about that experience and how it altered your life? Wow. <clears throat> yes, well, that yeah, that was a... Um it certainly was a life-altering experience, and, and what I, and I have no memory, particularly of the fight itself. I mean, I, I was a boy, and we fought. You know, boys played, and then they fought. Sure. And boom. Yeah. Um, what I remember is walking home from school, and um, full of intense emotion about the futility, not that I knew the word futility yeah, right. at that point, of what had just happened. That it, it just was so, it, it, it overwhelmed me how pointless it was to have it out with another kid over nothing. Uh, but I, I mean, I can't even find the right word as, as, as I think about it, but you know, beyond beyond the word futility, it just seems so stupid to fight. Um, and I don't know why it came to me. I don't know why that happened. It wasn't like I had read literature or anything like that. But I remember making this little silent vow to myself not to fight again. Wow. Um, at the age of 11. At the age of 11. And I, I think that clicked a switch that made me then start questioning things, questioning things that I was taught in a way that I would not have questioned them before I had done that. Um, you know, I mean, it took getting, I, I, and I don't remember if I won the fight or lost the fight. Mm. I mean, I, re, I have memories of fights, you know, in my young, you know, in my childhood that kind of blend together, and they're, and they're mean things. Yeah. Um, they're, they're mean things not just between the two participants, but between everybody else who's around. Uh, I, I know that on the playground, when there was a fight, every, kids would gather, and they would say this m terrible racist chant. I don't know if I should say this online, I, I, but I'll, I'll say it, and we can edit it out if we don't want it. But the kids it would, would give this chant, a fight, a fight between a nigger and a white. Mm -hmm. This is in the white, all-white suburb of Dearborn, Michigan. And then they would choose, in, in some mystical way, the children would choose sides, who they want who, the win, the fight, who they didn't. Then they, you know, a fight, a fight between a nigger and a white. Yeah. Come on, and if they chose the other kid to be the, the, the good guy, they would say, come on, Bobby, beat that white. So I became then the N-word, the, the nigger, or whoever they chose as the bad guy. I mean, this is, I, I, I mean, it was like a f fighting summoned something up out of the universe. <laughs> and, you know, and it, and, it, it, and it brought, you know, this is in the 1950s. It, it, it brought, you know, our race, you know, racial, you know, racism into the, even though it had nothing to do with race. This was an all-white suburb. Anyway, so... 
all of that stuff started to, you know, seemed to kind of come into my mind in that in that moment as I was walking home, and I let it go in some profound eleven year old way. Yeah, it's it's interesting because so much of our the broader culture creates a story for us. Mm -hmm. And we live into that story. And so Absolutely. you have the crowd who's chanting and cheering on this fight. Yeah. And you are participants in that larger story. Right. And in this story, it sounds like um, the way you tell it on the website, like you're walking home and you're, you've got gravel in your knees yes. and you're crying. And whether or not you actually won the fight or not is irrelevant because it sounds like there is both, no winning. you both really lost. Yeah. Right. You, we, we, we participated in something, you know, in, in a force field. We summoned yeah. up a force field yeah. that, you know, that was not a good thing, you know, that, yeah, I mean, that just created disharmony, you know, something, something evil, mm -hmm. you might say, you know, pulled into the playground and everyone, and it pulled everyone in. Yeah. And the participants and the, and the you know, and the onlookers were part of it too. Yeah, and it was bigger than any of bigger. you as individuals. Yeah. And it was even bigger than the group. No, the group couldn't control where this was going. Right. Was just... We we summoned all, all of the evil out of, you know, yeah. from, you know, you know, in our whole country into that moment. That was that was the tradition. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh it's a microcosm what's yeah. happening on the playground with what happens at on nation, national levels. Yes. And so forth. And so you are walking away from this, deciding that you will not participate in this story again. Right. And that is, I guess, the uh, the beginning, the impetus for the rest of your life into this peace journalism. That's how I look at it. At yeah. this, you know, many decades later, I go back to that moment, <laughs> you know, in in my life as a turning point. Yeah, that's powerful. Now, what does it mean? to be a peace journalist for you? Well, all right. I, th I think I've been a peace journalist for a long time, long before I actually ever was aware of that term. And I didn't invent the term. I, I found it, uh, there's a, we a website called transcend.org um, that talks about peace journalism. And I somebody had told me about that site, and that's where I first came upon that term. But as soon as I saw those two words, peace journalism, I knew that's what I was. Mm. Um, that's when I decided to create my own business cards. Now I now I knew what I was, yeah. and um, you know beyond just whatever organization I worked for in that moment. Um, yeah, I mean I I don't have a pat definition for peace journalism, um, but I would say that peace journalism tells the complex story. I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it tells the story of connecting and not the story of disconnection. And that's what our, you know, conventional journalism makes a big deal about disconnection and conflict. And, you know, and it has, and it, you know, it sort of celebrates that. It celebrates that, you know, in the if it bleeds, it leads kind of way. I'm sick of that. I'm sick of that. I'm sick of that as a profession. I don't want to be a part of that. I sometimes don't feel a part of a, the larger world of journalism um, be, because of that, you know, because of that lack of awareness. Um, I would say that um, for me a key phrase is um, power with versus power over. Yeah. And I think um, the world that we live in is too much of a world that gravitates towards the concept of power over, power, my power over you, my power to dominate you. We have to learn how to find power in connection with one another. And we know this. It's part of who we are. We couldn't build communities without, you know, a power with consciousness. Mm. But we don't celebrate that. Our our awareness is only that power means power over. Why do you think we're, it seems like we're addicted to it bleeds, it leads. It seems like we're addicted to power over. Yes. What is, where does that addiction come from? Oh, I think you could go back a long, long way. I mean, and, and, and there's no, you know, you know, and it could be that there's not a simple answer to this. I mean, um, but 
it's, I mean, we're addicted. I, I'd say we're addicted because we're addicted. Yeah. And, and so because we're addicted, this is how we act. Um, and I think the addiction goes back, I mean, I, I, you know, in, in, into, the, into the land of myth and theory. You know, wh you know how, where did we, when did we break away from being part of nature to being outside of nature? Mm. I think that's the question. And perhaps it's the human journey to break away from nature, um, but it's also part of the human journey to find our way back mm. to nature. That's, at least that's my own personal view on this. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the short answer to that question. But I would say the long version is what the show is all about, mm. which is to, to explore it over and over again, because there's no one simple answer. Yeah, that sounds like a fascinating project to me, so I'm glad we're doing it. Yeah, I am too. And I, it, you know, it's great to be um, here, you know, working with you, and I, you know, and and to work with the Raven Foundation. Oh, tell me about the Raven Foundation. Well, at uh, Raven, our um, mission is dual. So we seek to end scapegoating, and also provide paths towards peace. Okay. Um, and what we mean by that is so oftentimes the path that we think it leads to peace is through violence. Right. So what we end up doing when we're like addicted to this method of finding peace through violence is we think that we have to get rid of whatever it is, whoever it is in our community that is contaminating us. So right. we find a common enemy, somebody to unite over and against. And, and around. And around, yeah. exactly. It's, it's exactly what was happening to you when you were 11 years old. You yes. were both playing out this uh, scapegoating scene for the larger community. And this is what happens on national, global scales as, as well as in um, the schoolyard. And yes. so we end up finding unity over and against an individual or another group. This is racism. And um, we would say the reason why we are addicted to it is because, one of the reasons is because it gives us a sense of unity. It gives us a sense of common purpose. Right. And for temporarily, it gives us a sense of <clears throat> peace. And that peace is always false. Because right. whenever conflicts come back up again, you go back to what gave you that sense of peace, which is violence. And it will never lead to real peace because it's always at the expense of someone else. And so what are the ways in which we can build peace, that uh, true peace? That is the big challenge for us. Uh, so living peace that is not focused on an enemy out there. That's exactly it. Right. Yeah, peace that... Peace that actually seeks to include who we would call our enemies. Yes. Okay. Right? That's the only way that you will, that we as, yeah. uh, as a human group will come together and seek some kind of peace. And I think that, I, I think that, it, that you're right, that, it, that it's about, it's in part finding the interconnectedness that we all share, the common humanity that we all share. And mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we honor that? How do we invite our enemies in? How do we... Um, how do we seek to find that kind of mm -hmm. peace? It's much more difficult than finding a common enemy. It, it, yes. Yeah. That's, that, I mean, I think that's a really good point. Peace is not a simple thing. Right. And it is not the absence of, you know, war or violence. That is not the right definition of peace. Right. Peace is an act, just like health is not the absence of illness. Health is a ongoing event, I mean, an ongoing process that you work at and work at and then work at some more. Mm -hmm. Peace is nothing more than social health. Yeah, that's excellent. And, and what we want to explore in this uh, radio show is are people who are doing this. Yes. People who are uh, living out this social health that, right. that you're talking about. These are like, you might call them doctors. To, to expand the Doctors, metaphor. healers, midwives, or whatever you want yes. to... Yes, I, yeah. I, I love that. That's fascinating. Yeah. And Bob, you are uh, one of my doctors, one of my <laughs> healers. Um, and Bob has a weekly column um, called uh, at his website called Common Wonders, and you can also find it at the Huffington Post. And one of Bob's uh, recent articles is called Public Enemy Number One. And each radio show we are going to discuss one of... Bob's articles, and in Public Enemy Number One, Bob discusses our um, the American War on Drugs, 
so, Bob, I was wondering if you might want to introduce our listeners to um, maybe what you're saying in this article on public enemy number one. All right. Well, th this this um, particular column um, is based on a book by uh, Chris um, Christopher Glenn Fickner. Uh, the book is called Cannabinomics. <laughs> and <Great title. laughs> yeah, and um, cannabinomics, the marijuana policy tipping point. Uh, uh, Chris is a psychologist, and so he kind of the whole the book is sort of sort of a psychological diagnosis of the drug war and our um, you know you know and our relationship to this uh, uh, strange amazing plant called marijuana mm. you know and you know and and just challenges our our fear of it our our scapegoating of marijuana yeah. as, as an enemy when it has so many healing characteristics uh um you know and so it's what i you know call in the column you know the book is about the politics of irrationality um and um Maybe with you know stirring in some racism as well, and he goes through the history of uh, you know our our war on drugs, uh, you know back to the the 30s, and you know it's got a, and or or actually back to you know beginner earlier in the uh, 20th century, um, uh, you kind of fear of uh, you know Mexican culture, fear of Afri mm. for African American culture, um, and because the author. Um, is also in, 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 in the medical community as a psychologist. He, much of the book is focused on medical marijuana and both, you know, its, its usefulness in a medical sense and also the um, war against the use of medical marijuana. A lot of the examples of um, legal wrongs done to people are, are, are wrongs done to people who are using, you know, uh, the marijuana in some way medically, whether it's to relieve epileptic symptoms or to uh, alleviate, pa alleviate pain from, you know, one uh, sort of illness or another. Uh, and uh, these people are subject to legal brutalities, um, the same as the recreational users are, um, which, you know, adds another dimension of... Um, awfulness to, to this war. Yeah, you talk about um, that there's a minimum sentence for people who um, are found to be using these drugs, and that minimum sentence can be longer than um, people who get in jail for other more for violent, worse, crimes. violent crimes, such as rape and even murder. Right. Uh, the, the craziness of that just strikes me as... Uh, yeah, irrational. It, yeah, irrational is just it, it is the word. It it doesn't do justice to yeah. the emotional right. the emotion that that this brings up, you know. I mean, why, why, why? And um you know, there, there there's not necessarily a, you know a, a good, clear, or obvious answer why, you know, Amer I mean, marijuana did not used to be an enemy. Mm. Um but it became an enemy and now that it's an enemy, it's unquestioned. Yeah. And then, you know, as you know, as the author of the book points out, in the Reagan era, with the, you know, phrase, just say no, the debate was over. Mm. Just say no. There was no more, you know, there's no more debate on this topic. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know... <laughs> well, many people yeah. make the case that um, there are far worse drugs that are illegal, such as alcohol. Oh yes, and that—that's also a large part of this book. Yeah. Uh, yeah, is you know the, you know, all of the harm that you know that alcohol can do, and it's you know perfectly legal status. Um, uh, marijuana, any anything can be abused. Yeah. Obviously, anything can be abused, yeah. including, you know, something like marijuana. But um, even the consequences of abuse are far less than many, many legal substances. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you make the statement that the American drug policy, uh, the war on drugs, as it is called, has been just a complete disaster. Yes. And um, uh, it's fueled racism, and it's actually had the 
reverse effect of, since we've been fighting this war, uh, marijuana has actually increased in use. Well, marijuana and other drugs as well. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, the whole quote-unquote war on drugs, um, like the war on terror, has to I mean, it's really inaccurately inaccur named. I call the war on terror the war to pr promote terror. Right. And I think the war on drugs is the war to promote drugs. So, so violence, whether it's war on drugs or war on terror right. or whatever, has a reverse effect. It, it creates more of what we're trying to get rid of. I don't think anything that we've ever waged war on has ever, has ever disappeared from, yeah. you, know, you know, as a problem. Um, but it is certainly often accelerated as a problem mm -hmm. and um, which you know leads to the larger question what is the alternative to war on anything yeah yeah and what, what do you think that is what would you describe? well what I would describe is um, prescribe mm -hmm. well you know you know one one word I, of course is peace but um, you know that doesn't give an answer, um, love your enemy. I love it. How can we start loving marijuana? <laughs> <laughs> I think marijuana is a relatively easy enemy to, to begin to love. Well, it's, it's Many not... people have made that step. Yeah, yeah. Shockingly, it's true. Well, it's interesting because um, you, you bring up the story of a man who uh, has epilepsy. Yes and has these bouts with epilepsy multiple times a week. Yeah. Um, and he reluctantly started taking marijuana medicinally. Right. And He was that, not a pothead. No. He, yeah. he was reluctant in, in, in doing it. And it took it down to these episodes to being once a month. Right. And when he went to his doctors, the doctors said, oh, no, we have to go in, do brain surgery on you, do this invasive stuff, and maybe it'll work, maybe Wait, not. Remove part of his temporal lobe was one of the suggested uh, procedures. Yeah. So, th yeah, they were willing to, yeah, to, to enter his forehead or whatever and, 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 and take away part of his brain as a possible solution that may have accomplished no more than smoking one, you know, having one hit uh, on, a, uh, on, you know, on a marijuana cigarette per day. Um, but... The, you know, <clears throat> the doctors would not discuss marijuana as a possible solution. Now, I mean, for whatever reason, I mean, a lot of, you know, not to indict the entire medical profession because of that, but that is the story in uh, Chris's book is, is the story of Seth and who just dramatically reduced the incidences of incidents of grand mal seizures, which were not pleasant things to go through. Well, to the doctor's yeah. uh, to the doctor's point, I mean, if a doctor prescribes an illegal drug, yeah, no, right, yeah, right, he would get in trouble. Yeah. So it, yeah, it's not so much the doctor's fault it, right. as the larger, you know, community's fault. But and this the, is this is going back to scapegoating an enemy. Yes. And your title, public enemy number one, where our enemy could actually be our friend. Right, right, used, right. Used correctly, used, used responsibly. Used correctly, used responsibly, and and used. Yeah, I mean, I would even step away from that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, used in a way. I mean, I'm not even. I'm not. I'm. <laughs> I'm not an enemy of recreational marijuana use, no. um, and. Um, I think there's a way in which it's uh, it can be our friend in that way as well. Sure. More than um, you know, more than alcohol mm -hmm. is our friend mm -hmm. in that in that way. Yeah, yeah. So um, this leads us into our first interview um, with Nick Angotti, who is exploring nonviolent ways of transforming schools in Chicago and dealing with uh, bullying and providing alternative paths to peaceful Chicago schools. And later in the program, we will be interviewing Jim Papandrea, um, who is a professor at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary and is also a musician whose music is devoted to peace.
We are pleased to have with us Dr. Nick Angotti. Hi, Nick. Hey, hi. Good morning. Uh, thank you for being us. Um, Nick, if you don't mind me saying this, you have lived a very fascinating life. Nick is an actor and has starred in over 50 television shows, has appeared in about 12 feature films, and in hundreds of commercials. Nick is also a Minister of Religious Science and earned a Doctorate of Divinity in 2008. He has produced his own television show called Say Yes to Life, which explores spirituality and the human condition. He has also produced two television series, uh, one called Restorative Justice in Action and another called Seasons for Nonviolence, Chicago Youth. Nick is the executive director of Transcendence Global Media and the founder and executive director of Peace on Earth Film Festival. Nick, uh, once again, thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you. I, uh, I'm, I'm, this is a good thing. Excellent. Now, you have accomplished many things in your life. In being an actor and a minister, story seems to have an important place for you. Can you tell us a bit about the importance of story? Well, a story is essential to everything. I mean, when we go out, for instance, when we go out to speak to kids um, with our Dialogue for Peace program, and I know we'll get in m more into that later, but when we go out there, the, the thing we want to emphasize with them is that story is essential to everything and that each one of them has a story that um. needs to be told because story frees us up. Uh, Margaret Wheatley, we, we use her quote, um, she said, you can't hate the one whose story you know. Wow, that's Once you beautiful, have yeah. story, it, 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 it bonds you. It just bonds you. Um, and every story is unique. There is no generic story. And, and, and that means every child is unique. And if they've got, if they've got their own story, wow. I think that's a great thing. Wow. Well, Nick, um, the, the Dialogue for Peace program how did can you talk about that what that is and how it came about uh yes i will uh and uh but i want to go back a bit uh one second uh, story is also essential with our festival because what we look for when we see films uh even though we're looking for the best film as far as quality of of production but what's essential is that we have a good story and the story is being told wow what is it that makes a story good? Because there it are makes a stories. Oh, go ahead. Uh, uh, what I believe makes a story good is something that's compelling, something that holds you. Oftentimes with the kids, I'll ask them, what's your favorite film? And, and they, many of them will bring up films that, that have violence in it. And, and the reason why is they really want to say it needs conflict. And conflict can come in many, many, many ways, ideally, uh, it, it could come with, um, you know, someone having to deal with themselves, someone having to deal with the elements, or someone having to deal with another force around them, uh, another individual or, or, or set of circumstances. So um, ideally with, our, with the stories we seek out, um, we want to see issues around the world that, that any issue that disrupts the individual's capacity to live life freely is essential to what we call peace. And so uh, we look for stories that, uh, that have conflict, but the conflict usually is um, uh, with the circumstances around them and how they grapple with that and come to resolution, because we also seek resolution. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating, because conflict is inevitable amongst humans, but there are, I guess, positive ways that we can deal with conflict. Can you give us an example of um, one of the movies um, that you show that um, brings up this conflict in a positive way of dealing with it? Well, one of our award winners, or excuse me, not it wasn't an award winner, but one of the, the major highlights of our first festival was, was a film called uh, The Imam and the Pastor. Oh. Mm. Uh, and it, it dealt with... Um, <laughs> I don't and, and I, I, I can't recall the country right now, but it dealt with the issues of, of religion in this particular country. And not only, it, it was Africa, but not only was it, was it feuding religions, but it was, it was feuding clans trying to kill each other. Uh, one of the, uh, I believe it was the imam who lost his brother and the, um, and the minister who lost uh, use of one arm. 
and they finally realized that the only way that they were going to resolve anything was to get together, uh, find a common convergence or a convergence of theory, a convergence of thoughts, and discover where they, where their beliefs were common. And they began preaching uh, together. They began, uh, well, the word preaching doesn't sound right for me right now, but they began speaking on the qualities of the other, and they healed the issues within um, within their territory, within their uh, their community, uh, between the two uh, these two uh, rival factions. So, so instead of spe- seeking revenge or punishment for wrongdoing, they focused on healing. Yes. That's, that's they searched out the healing. Important they, distinction. Uh, go ahead. Qu- quite a quite an important distinction. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, we also um, we also get films that um, that stress story, but don't don't necessarily come to resolve that that are there to um, to try and provoke the audience into um, changing their concepts or their ideas or their theories on life. And um, we, we, we see a number of uh, films like that. For instance, uh, we reviewed a film just yesterday uh, that dealt with an uh, Indian medicine, medicine man hmm. in, um, in um, South, uh, North Dakota. And it was the, uh, apparently it's the most impoverished community, uh, most impoverished county in the country. And this Indian medicine man was accused by his former daughter-in-law that, of molesting her children. He was proven not guilty by the tribal um, inquisition or the tribal uh, council. But he was still put on trial because uh, there are still elements going on within our country, in particular areas where uh, indigenous people uh, still um, live to try and suppress them. And um, he went to jail even though uh, there was no evidence, even though he was impotent, they, 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 he still went to jail because uh, they refused to, uh, to listen to the evidence. And so these are issues, too, that just need to be heard. And um, we have two, two common threads uh, within our mission, within our vision, and, and that, that's one is to give voice to filmmakers so they can tell stories that don't... Nor- that don't normally reach exhibition, don't normally reach theaters. So we, uh, we seek to find them an audience, and we also seek to create dialogue on issues. Okay. And um, dialogue happens at the, um, at the venue where we have our festival, but dialogue also extends, of course, into our Dialogue for Peace outreach program, which we bring to the schools. Right, which is very exciting. I mean, and, and I don't know of any other film festival or film, you know, venue at all that includes that is is an is as inclusive as um, the Peace on Earth Film Festival because you bring the whole Chicago public school system into it. Um, how, how did how did that come about? How did you begin to outreach to the schools? Well, it's interesting because in my ministry. Uh, the ministry that religious science that uh, that I've taught for years is the positive energy that that exists around this thing most people call God, and how um, uh, to to recognize that there's a goodness in it all. And I had one of the uh, one of the people who used to come quite often on Sundays uh, had been teaching in the schools for a number of years, and also had had been lobbying the um, the school board to bring more positive um, positive concepts. To, to students in school, and he wanted me to help develop a program that uh, would um, would do this uh, with with the, the things we teach within the religion. Well, the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, I don't have to go the religious route. Huh. We've got films coming in. Why don't we create a program around the films? Yeah. And we got very close to selling the idea to, uh, to Chicago Public Schools, and then um, forces beyond our, our control... Um, to disrupt. So um, Melissa Pacelli, who's one of our uh, co-founders and directors, and um, Clayton Monocle is also a co-founder and director, but specifically Melissa and I decided to create a program where we would select several films, invite students and their teachers from schools around Chicago to come to the Cultural Center, which is, the, which is our venue for the festival, to come on the first day in the morning, and we would present films there. 
and we would engage the kids in dialogue on the um, on the content of the film. And what happened after that was um, it, it was just a grand success. And uh, one of the teachers, as well as a uh, as well as a director of um, international baccalaureate studies uh, in one of the schools, uh, elementary schools, came to us and said, "How can we get this film?" And I said, "Well, we have a program. As of yet, we hadn't developed it." He said, "We have a program to go into the schools." And uh, he said, um, "How much?" And I gave him a price, and he went, "Well, well, we can't do that." And I said, "Well, how about?" your school, and you help us pilot this. And he says, okay. Huh. And that's what happened. So Melissa and I sat down. We went into uh, Illinois, uh, went into all the uh, the different websites to give us an idea of what the standards were for Illinois curriculum. And we, we, we created a standard around uh, some basic essentials. And uh, we piloted it uh, in April of 2010. And since then, we've seen over 5,000 kids in over 18 different schools. Wow, Nick, this is fascinating to me because um, a lot of feelings are that um, the sh schools in Chicago are hopeless. Um, there's a lot of despair about the violence that's going on in schools, not just in Chicago, but around the country. Um, what hope have you found uh, in your work for youth? Well, um, uh, what hope? It, hope is the word you used? Yeah. Oh, well, I, you know, frankly, uh, I was a kid who was always disrupting the class. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, when, I was, when I was young, I, I went through a, a series of incidents with teachers that I believe didn't understand me, and they were cruel in their punishment. And so I just, I do my best to see myself in, in the kids. And um, I found out after the fact, I went into Harper High School uh, a couple of years ago with our program, and, they, and we had to reduce it to 20 minutes. It's normally an hour and a half to two hours. We had to reduce it to 20 minutes, and so I was really, uh, uh, really put to the test. And uh, it was a film based on, ass on assumptions. Uh, that, that was the core theme, is uh, what we assume about Americans, what we assume about life. And... Um, so I built the whole 20 minutes on assumptions along with the film, and um, some of the kids uh, look like, you know, they may have been in gangs or certainly uh, in that area of um, where they could go in that direction. Mm. And so what I did, I did my best to, if I needed them to come in closer, if I needed them to listen, if I needed them to turn off a, a um, you know, uh, a cell phone or whatever, I would go over and whisper in their ear that... Um, it's really important that we hear what you have to say. And if you're not listening, then you're not going to be able to have the information to, uh, to voice what you have to say or what your opinion is. And every one of those kids moved into the circle. They put their devices down. And I found out later that wow. uh, in fact, uh, within the past um, several months, I found out that that particular group was... Um, a group of kids that, that fall into the category of a risk, at risk. In other words, they're not in gangs yet, but they're at risk because they're, they're in a marginal stage where they could easily go in that direction. I had no idea that that was the group that they had given me. And, um, and I heard that what we had that day was a, created an impact. That's, that's Can we measure that impact? The only way we're going to be able to measure the impact is we, our intention is to develop a program where we can come in, uh, let's say, every once a month or every three weeks over a period of, say, of, uh, three, four, five months and then begin to, to measure whether we've made an impact. Wow, well, yeah. It's, it's powerful because it sounds to me like you're not only modeling healthy relationships for the students that you interact with, but also for the teachers. So um, oftentimes teachers will use punishment techniques, such as shaming. So if somebody is texting or something, you yell at them, say, put your phone away. Or, or, or kick them out of the classroom. <laughs> exactly, or kick them out of the classroom. But what you uh, are flipping that around and saying, what we need to do is empower our children, give them a voice. Do you find yourself not only um, creating the positive environment for um, students, but also modeling a different way for teachers? Yes. In fact, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, when we talked to uh, 
the uh, International Baccalaureate Director at uh, the Locke Elementary School. Um, when we talked to her about it, uh, later she wrote in a letter she, back to us uh, to endorse. Uh, she said that this is a program that, that the schools need, the teachers need, and the students need. And it's a program that expands, um, that can expand on programs the teachers have already begun. Uh, recently, uh, we went into an, an elementary school in the Chatham area of Chicago, and um, the principal there uh, said that um, I, I'm not I'm not quoting her, but this is the, essentially what she said: is that there's not enough emphasis on social studies. What we have expands on social studies that oftentimes the kids don't even pay attention to the news, that they may come out of households that don't pay attention to the news, and we are bringing, we are bringing essential ideas to the kids, engaging them, engaging them in, um, in discussions and causing them to become more current, causing them to become more aware. And uh, she even said th this particular program that we have Dialogue for Peace should not only be in her school, but all schools throughout Chicago, because her kids will get it, and they'll go back into the neighborhood, and they'll be with kids who didn't get it, and it'll just bring them back, could bring them back to where they were. And, and once again, it, <clears throat> your, your whole method is to bring the children, bring the young people into it, because they matter, their opinions matter, and their thoughts matter. Um, that's not the way we think of education. It's usually something administered from the outside, you know, and all, all the, the role of the children is to absorb it and pay attention. But it, it doesn't, but they're not part of it. You're saying that they're part of it. Exactly. What their, their opinion is absolutely essential because oftentimes uh, it's like you cut open the top of their head and just pour in information right. and... Uh, what they have to say is not important. They just need to regurgitate what's been given to them. Uh, one of our teachers said that that what we have is rigorous, and it engages the students. And the students, when they find when they are engaged, they be, become excited about what they're learning at school, and they want to be excited about what they're learning. Absolutely, yeah. That's great. The dialogue is absolutely essential, and that's what we that's what we do. We we let them know initially that. Their opinion is important, and the only way that we're going to change the world is by, by helping them to engage in dialogue where they can begin to understand each other, you know, break down the resistance within the individual and within the coupling of, of individuals in the classroom, and you begin to plant the seeds for a greater peace in the world. Wow. That's great. How can uh, if people are interested in getting involved, uh, how might they do that? Well, our website is peaceonearthfilmfestival.org. They can also put in poeff.org, and that'll bring them to our, our, our festival website. They can also uh, contact us through info at peaceonearthfilmfestival.org. And if a uh, teacher uh, should happen to be listening in on this, um, are there materials on your website uh, that could help them out in creating this type of program? If they, they can contact me directly at Nick Peace on Earth Film Festival, okay. and, uh, and I, will direct, I will send to them uh, within 24 hours everything they need. Wonderful. Well, Nick, thank you very much thank for being you, with us. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Excellent. And best of luck in, the, in all of your projects in the future. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Hey, have a great day. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It's a pleasure to have Dr. Jim Papandrea with us. Jim is a professor of Christian history at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary and has been involved in church ministry. Jim has six forthcoming books, Novation of Rome and the Culmination of Pre-Nicene Orthodoxy, Reading the Early Church Fathers, Rome Sick, Making Your Pilgrimage to the Eternal City, A Spiritual Homecoming, 
Trinity 101, the earliest Christologies, and my personal favorite, how to be a saint, although I'd rather be a sinner. <laughs> Uh, that's my own uh, tagline there. Uh, Jim is also a musician and is our resident musical critic. Uh, and today we are going to open uh, some of Jim's music up for critique. Thanks for being with us, Jim. Uh, my pleasure. It's great to be here. Now we want uh, you to be a gentle critic today because um, we're looking for peace. Um, do you think you can handle that? I consider myself a peaceful guy, so... Excellent, excellent. Well, we'll start off with some qu some questions. What role does your faith play in your music? Uh, well, I am a Christian uh, of the Roman Catholic variety, but um, as, a, as a Christian, I like to consider myself a follower of Jesus Christ. And um, Jesus was always saying, peace be with you. Mm -hmm. And... Um, especially in moments when uh, his disciples or others were anxious or afraid and um, he seemed to want them to have peace. Uh, I, I believe that there are two kinds of peace. Uh, peace on earth, which of course the angels proclaimed at his birth, and uh, also peace of mind. Um, and I've come to the conclusion that Peace on earth begins with peace of mind. So when Jesus said, peace be with you, um, I think he, was, uh, he had as a priority uh, working with individuals to bring peace to individual lives. I, I know it's fashionable in some cases to talk about Jesus as a revolutionary, but I don't really see him that way. I see Jesus as someone who... Um, didn't try to change the world so much as tried to change individuals. And by doing that, he did change the world. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's mm -hmm. fascinating. There's this passage uh, where Jesus talks about peace, and he says, peace I leave with you, but I don't give you peace the way the world gives you peace. What's the distinction there that Jesus is trying to make, do you think? Uh, that, that's a great question, and um, I guess I've always interpreted that as uh, having something to do with um, Jesus' giving people what they need, even when that's not what they want. Mm. And sometimes God works with us that way, um, you know, there's there's an old cliche, God always answers prayer, sometimes the answer is no. Mm. And so um, I think what Jesus is saying there is that um, the answer to our prayers, the, 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 the things we ask for may not come to us in the way we want them to come to us or may not come to us in the way we expect. And too often, you know, we try to control everything and uh, sometimes it requires giving up that control. There are different kinds of peace music. There are some peace music that seems to be more protest, or mm -hmm. what we might say in the Christian tradition, uh, prophetic, maybe. Um, yeah, right. But there's also uh, more uh, a peace music that gives a sense of peace, as opposed to being what we're against, there's what we're for. Mm -hmm. Where does your music lie in that stream? Well, I'm, I'm, my personal music is definitely in the second uh, one. I mean, there, obviously there's a whole genre of protest music that goes back, um, well, in, in my lifetime to the Vietnam War, um, even though I was a kid at the time, I was sort of vaguely aware of, uh, you know, some of the protest music and then later as a teenager learned to you know, play all those great <coughs> old songs on the guitar. Um, but... Uh, but for me, I, you know, the, the songs that I write are um, not so much uh, seeking peace through protest, but uh, seeking that, that peace of mind, that sort of uh, inner peace that I think Jesus was talking about primarily. And so, um, so, the, so the music that I write, uh, I'm trying to be increasingly more sort of peaceful in, you know, in the style of music that I write, and then also the message is, uh, you know, trying to, to write lyrics that promote a message of, of peace and um, peace of mind, forgiveness, 
inner healing, that sort of thing. And, uh, it, you know, it's a process. I mean, I've written a lot of songs over a lot of years, and so, you know, you can go back in time and find some of my music that is more edgy, more sarcastic <coughs> even, but uh, I don't know if it's, uh, you know, as I uh, get older or what, but um, I'm, I'm moving more and more in this direction toward the kind of music that um, that will hopefully bring peace of mind. When you, when you begin the creative process, um, do you have to find peace of mind first? Do you find it as you're creating? How does that work for you? Well, that's, that, that's a great <clears throat> question, and I, I think it's really part of a bigger question. And, you know, if, if I believe that peace on earth begins with peace of mind, and I do, then, you know, how does one get peace of mind? For me, the creative process is one way to work toward peace of mind. Mm -hmm. Some people, I, I believe... Um, don't have the peace they look for because they don't have an outlet for their own creativity. Right. Um, in my book, Spiritual Blueprint, I talk a lot about um, these different areas of life and how to sort of create order out of chaos in your life and, um, and, and create a life that, that's more peaceful and more uh, full of hope. And you know, one of the things I talk about is that uh, we all need an outlet for our creativity. So for me, it might be writing songs. For someone else, it might be scrapbooking or, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, there's, there's an endless variety. One does not have to be artsy in order to be creative. Um, but I think we all need to find a creative outlet uh, so that we can, uh, you know, so that we can be creative. I mean, we're, we are <coughs> created in the image of yeah. a God who is a creator. So mm. we're created to be creative. So creativity is sort of a divine activity. I, I agree, yeah. I, I believe that's true. And, um, and if, if, uh, if we go through life without any outlet for creativity, mm -hmm. um, we're going to feel stifled. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any musical role models, any people that you have influenced <coughs> your music? I do. Uh, some of them are in the uh, you know the Christian world, and some of them are not. Um, I, uh, I I'm I've always been a big fan of Steve Miller. He's one of my favorite songwriters, and uh, you know it, it just happens that you know we sort of have a family connection with him. My dad played in a band with him years years ago before there was ever a Steve Miller band. So you know I, he he's actually been kind of a mentor to me, which which is uh, which has been nice. But then. Also in the uh, in the Christian music world, um, John Michael Talbot has been a kind of a, a mentor or um, an influence, let's say. Uh, and there are others, you know. Um, I listen to a lot of different kinds of music, um, love reggae music, um, and um, you know I, I love you know a lot of the different kinds of. Uh, what we used to call new age music, like you know uh, the electronic music and things, especially the, you know the ones that are more peaceful sounding and and relaxing. Um, but you know I listen to you know a lot of classic rock, you know a lot of singer songwriter acoustic guitar stuff and electronic music and a little of everything. So it you know it, as a songwriter, you you can't help but have everything you listen to influence what you do mm -hmm. in one way or another. Can you talk a bit about um, the early church and the way that the early church might have used music? Oh yeah. Um, well, we you know we know that the early Christians sang as a part of their liturgy from the very beginning. In fact, in in one of the earliest references to Christianity by non Christians, by the, the governors and the emperors, uh, we have a letter. Um, between a governor and the emperor from uh, the early part of the second century, where the governor, you know, one of the one of the few things that the Romans knew about the Christians was that they sang hymns about Christ. Um, so that's been a part of of Christian worship from the very beginning, and uh, probably singing back then meant a kind of um, call and response. Um, Maybe a little bit more like chanting than what we think of as singing, but uh, if you know if you can think of uh, a, having a situation where you have a, a cantor or a leader who sings a line like a refrain, and then the congregation either sings that back or perhaps repeats that refrain while the cantor sings, um, you know, verses. It would be that kind of a situation, and uh, you know we don't know a lot about 
you know, what the music would have sounded like. We have little hints here and there. Um, but, but we do know that uh, singing was a part of worship from the very beginning. That's fascinating to me because it sounds like the singing was about participation, this call and response. Absolutely. <coughs> which yeah. is uh, a, a microcosm, I guess, yeah. of what the whole Christian life is in this participation in the life of something bigger, in the life yeah. of Jesus. So, music creates community. Mm. Right, yeah. yeah. No, that, that's a very good point because um, we have hints that there may have been more um, performance kinds of songs in the early church, um, almost as a kind of gift someone would bring as a, as a gift or an offering. Okay, well, I have a song, I made up this song, and they would sing it. But that seems not to have lasted. It seems to have fallen by the wayside in favor of more participatory music. So for the most part in the early church, you don't get these sort of choir anthems where the congregation sits there and listens and a select person or group sings. Right. No, it would be much more um, about the congregation. Everyone singing. takes part in the divine act of creating, making music. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. I love it. So that, that's different from how things are today. Yeah, it depends on, on one's tradition. And, yeah. you know, different <clears throat> denominations have, uh, you know, more or less participatory music. But, um, uh, but yeah, you're, you know, you're right. We, we do tend to, in some, in some of our traditions, we tend to fall into a sort of performance model, which I think is problematic. I, one of my songs that we talked about playing is uh, called I Will Be With You. It's based on the 23rd Psalm. And, um, and, and in this song, basically, it's the, uh, the, the voice of the singer is meant to be speaking for God here, and the message is that, you know, no matter what you go through, um, God will be with you. Let's go ahead and listen to I Will Be With You. Life gives no promises, no guarantees This isn't heaven, it's not supposed to be So don't believe them if they tell you It should be all mountaintops, there are valleys too You know it's true And the only thing you need to know When you find yourself in the shadows I will be with you I will be with you I will be with you I will be there Life is a long chain second chances so don't ever be afraid to learn new dances and when you find it's time to start again and you need a trusted hand to comfort you to walk with you well the only thing you need to know when you find yourself in the shadows I will be with you So I Will Be With You is 
uh, as you said, a song about God's message to us, and it's based on the 23rd Psalm. Right, um, right. What does the 23rd Psalm mean to you? Well, um, this is the one, you know, people are, are probably pretty familiar with this, even if they're not big Bible readers, because, uh, you know, this is the one that you always hear in the movies and on TV when you go to a funeral or something, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and, and you know, the, the, um, the familiar line is, you know, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and, you know, then God is with me. And so um, that's the message that, uh, and I think, again, it goes back to what you were saying about the words of Jesus in the sense that, you know, God doesn't always give us what we want. God gives us what we need. Or, to put it another way, God doesn't always give us what we ask for in the way we think we should get it. And so, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a sense of, you know, I never promised you a rose garden here, you know. I mean, um, you, you know, this this life isn't going to be perfect. Um, and so the the question is not whether or not God is going to make our lives perfect. The question is, you know, how are we going to respond to adversity and hardship? And the, the promise of Psalm 23 is that whatever we go through, God goes through it with us. That's powerful. One of the first verses in the song is, this isn't heaven, it wasn't meant to be so, there will be valleys, but God will be with you. One of the... Uh, why is it so difficult for us to feel that God is with us? Why is it so easy sometimes to feel that God has abandoned us or the world? Well, that's you know that's a tough question, and you know it gets to uh, um, the the issue of suffering and and why people suffer, and you know the the, the church, those within and outside of the church have struggled for centuries with the question of, you know, if God is really good and God is really all-powerful, then why is there evil in the world? And I, I think, you know, that there is no simple answer to that. The, um, the best answer I can come up with has something to do with free will and the fact that God allows free will and, and most, if not all, suffering in this world is, you know, somehow probably the result of the misuse of human free will. Um, so... Your question is why you know why is it sometimes hard to feel that God is close to us? I think you know maybe because we expect things from God that are um, unrealistic. You know, um, if we suffer, we wonder why God hasn't protected us from the suffering. And again, that you know sometimes the answer is because we've created our own suffering. Other times, that's not the case. And you know, we, I guess we can't speak for other people, but. Um, but I think, you know, sometimes we create the distance between us and God, and then we wonder why God isn't there. You know? Could it also be that God is manifesting in a way that we don't recognize as God? Yeah, absolutely. Right, right. And sometimes, sometimes God works in our lives through the other people in our lives. And sometimes, unfortunately, suffering... Uh, people respond to suffering by pushing people away from them, and they're pushing away from them the very people whom God yeah. is trying to to use to to work in their life. So it can be a vicious cycle, but um, it's you know it's tough. And and uh, getting yeah. back to the music that you write in the creative process, does does the music does the creation of the music help you see God where you didn't know God was there, or you? Um, I think it's I think it's more the other way around. I think okay. the music that I write is my response to having experienced God in my life in the sense that um, I'm grateful for some experience of God or the feeling of presence of God in my life or grateful simply for the blessings of life and and I respond to that by writing music. Mm -hmm. In other cases I um you know, when there's tragedy, you know, death of someone in the family or something, I have responded to that by writing songs. Okay. So, um, so in a way, writing music is um, is a response to those things, but also it is uh, it is a form of prayer for me. It is a form of connecting with God uh, through that creative process and through the insights that you know I may or may not have. But um, but it is it is the the songwriting process I would say is definitely a part of my devotional life one way or another. Great. Let's go to uh, another song of yours uh, called "Look at the Sparrow." Um, before we listen to it, what? 
does this song mean to you? Well, it's this this song is almost entirely, uh, you know, paraphrased from the words of Jesus in the Gospels. Um, and uh, I've always been interested in writing songs that uh, that are based on Scripture, and that but that make Scripture accessible to people who maybe don't read a lot of Scripture. And so this is um, this is from you know from Jesus's uh, words about you know look at the sparrow, um, God takes care of the birds, and God cares about you so much more. So have have faith, have peace of mind that God is. Um, on your side. God cares for you, and God is with you throughout your life. Great. Let's listen to Look at the Sparrow. Leave behind the past, never mind tomorrow. Look at the sparrow She doesn't have a care She lives one day at a time She doesn't trust in the things that rust She knows everything will be fine Leave behind the past Never mind tomorrow Your father will take care of you Just look at the sparrow She doesn't have regrets knows every day is new Her praise she sings to God her King And Jesus carries her through Leave behind the past Never mind tomorrow Your Father will take care of you Just look at the sparrow She doesn't tie herself down By collecting things on the ground Sets her eyes on the upward prize So the kingdom may be found Leave behind the past Never mind tomorrow Your father will take care of you Just look at the sparrow If the Christian faith is about participating um, in a community and God takes care of us as God takes care of a sparrow and says that we are so much even more important than a sparrow, what does that mean for how we live life together? Well, I think um, the first the first thing we have to do is move beyond looking at how God relates to us as individuals and how God relates to me. So, you know, step one, Jesus says, God loves me. Okay, good, I get that. But you can't stop with step one. Step two is, guess what? God loves you just as much as God <coughs> loves me. And so we have to see um, that that sparrow-loving God in the other people as well. And and not assume yeah. that uh, that I am somehow God's favorite, and that you know that, that there are people whom God loves less. Wait, you know? what? <laughs> so I think I, I think that's maybe the you know the, the way to go from there. And the, and the image of the sparrow. I mean, I love that image, and it's like I, suddenly I'm feeling like the sparrow is the soul. Mm. And yes. It, yeah. It, it's. This fragile, precious thing, mm -hmm. and we all have it. Yeah. Right, right. That's yeah, that's a good image. I like it. So it, the story, the song, it's expansive. It's um, not just about me as an individual. It's not just about me as a Christian or us as a Christian. It includes all of the cosmos, as 
John might say. Absolutely. Or, or as, as Francis might say, yeah. it includes the animals. I mean, yeah. you know, Jesus yeah. is talking about sparrows, and you can take it on a literal level, too, to a certain extent, that, you know, God loves all of creation. And so we don't have the right to um, abuse or exploit creation, um, you know, as, mm -hmm. as, though, as though God won't notice. One of the verses that I found especially powerful in this song um, for peace is the verse, don't be afraid to learn new dances. What are some of the old dances that <laughs> we get caught up into that might not lead us into uh, peace of mind or um, peace for the world? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, you've probably heard the old cliche that, uh, you know, one definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And and we we are tempted to act that way in life. I mean, everyone has their old dances. Everyone has their habits. Um, but I think the worst part of it is to have regrets about your past that are um, that that hold you down or hold you back from moving forward, and to and to feel like. Um, our past is uh, is preventing us from living in the present and in the future. And mm. this this idea of of you know learn don't be afraid to learn new dances. To me, it means look you know um, God is a God of second chances and 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 third chances and fourth chances. And we um, we have this forgiveness available to us. That God offers to forgive us and and. Um, I think we uh, we make that more complicated than it is, and 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 maybe we could we could tap into this 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 clean start, this this clean slate kind of thing that uh, that, that that Jesus offers. There's also a sense of joy in this. Uh, in uh, the title of the radio program is playing for keeps, and dancing is certainly has a mm -hmm. sense of play in mm -hmm. it. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the early Christians and um, this sense of how God is in a dance. Hmm. Well, that's you know that's an interesting question. I mean, um, I'm not sure all of the early Christians would want Christians to dance. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them would, and some of them wouldn't. And yeah. you know, we have we, we we have a whole sort of range of responses to um, how Christians connect with uh, with society. Um, to the to the extreme on one end where you have some early Christian writers who say, uh, you know, whatever it is, if you like it, it's probably a sin, and uh, <laughs> you know, and then others that are that uh, are more, um, you know, you know, a little bit more <laughs> more free with that. But but I but I do think in the early church there was a real concern about how Christians engage with the culture around them and to what extent they adopt or or. Um, or continue in the, the practices. So, you know, in the early church, you have all kinds of baggage when it comes to things like dance and the theater because there's a lot of, um, you know, pagan religion that that, that is involved in that. Um, so it's it's kind of a tough question to answer. Uh, but you know, in our context, I think it's a I think it's a good image because um, dancing really is something meant to, to be done with other people. You can dance alone, but, yeah. uh, but it's, it's, uh, right. it, it's another thing that builds community. Like, yeah, like music. Well, interestingly, when you were talking about, I mean, back to the idea of forgiveness and, and the past holding us back, suddenly I saw forgiveness as a dance. Mm. And it was a beautiful image. And mm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting point. I mean, yeah. because, it, you know, it does take... Um, <clears throat> A, a give and take, and, and I really believe, and I talk about this in Spiritual Blueprint as well, I, I really believe that one of the biggest barriers to peace of mind is a lack of forgiveness. Yes. People either feel like they're not forgiven, or they refuse to forgive others. And this is another thing, you know, Jesus was big on saying um, that, for, that, that the refusal to forgive is itself a sin. Mm. Um, and that we really have to be willing to forgive each other, um, and and you know holding a grudge is just like uh, someone you know someone once said that 
that holding a grudge is like drinking poison and hoping it kills the other person, <laughs> you know, because it, it really affects the person holding the grudge more than anyone else, and right. and it really does uh, hold us back from from living um, a healthy life in the present and in the future. So I, I think forgiveness is a really really important issue when it comes to um, when it comes to peace. Right. Why do you, why do you think it's so difficult to forgive? Because I think that people believe, as human beings, we believe we're entitled to certain things. Mm. One of the things we've, you know, been conditioned to believe we're entitled to is justice. So if someone wrongs me, um, my first reaction is to believe that I'm entitled to justice, which, you know, I don't know, whatever form that might take in my own mind, um, but you know how it is. You fantasize about these grand apologies that you might get or something, and the, you know those things just often aren't forthcoming. And I think that the reason it's so hard is because we have to let go of that sense of entitlement and, and, and leave the justice stuff up to God. You know, um, Justice is not in our job description. It's just not. And, justice is another word for consequences. Well, yeah, sure. Um, or some sort of satisfaction, or some sort of groveling and humility on the part of the other person uh, who we think owes us an apology. You know, we want to see them grovel. Well, you know, it doesn't always work that way. So, um, but if if I spend my whole life grinding my teeth over this need for another person to grovel in my presence and, and apologize to me, I'm wasting my life. It feels more like revenge to me than. Well, yes, yeah, it's another word for justice. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, yeah. right. And again, that's not in our job description. Right. Yeah. right. Well, Jim, thank you for being with us. If people want to be more involved in uh, what you are doing, uh, where should they go? Well, I guess I would have people start with the uh, the website for my book, Spiritual Blueprint. Uh, it's uh, spiritualblueprint.org, and from there they can link to my personal website and, and, uh, and other pages. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. Well, Bob, it was really great to hear from Jim and Nick. We had some excellent interviews and conversations with them. You yes. know, one of the things that uh, Nick was talking about was empowering students. Yes, yes, absolutely. absolutely. And, and helping them to be heard. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that Jim was talking about was forgiveness, the importance to both forgive and to be forgiven at the same time. Right. I wonder, how did these empowering and forgiveness fit together. Yeah, that, I think, well, it goes back to the idea of power with versus power over. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is power with. It's the, it's the essence of power with another person. When I forgive you, then suddenly we are in, surrounded in a context, a different context than when I don't forgive you. Mm -hmm. when, when I don't forgive you, you are the enemy and... You have, you yeah, and, 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 and we suck the whole world into, in, into that negativity. When I, when I do forgive you, we, we instantly create a different kind of world mm. in that moment mm -hmm. and in that spot. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a powerful and, distinction, power with instead of power over and against. Uh, yeah, yeah, I believe, yeah, that's a distinction I think that helps, really helps clarify what we're trying to do with this show. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we've heard from two stories today, from Jim and from Nick, and we've actually heard three because we had our discussion earlier about your article. Right. And those are three powerful stories of power with another. Absolutely. And I look forward to our next show. Same here. When we explore it again. Bob and I would like to thank you for listening. If you would like to learn more, you can go to Bob's website, commonwonders.com, and you can go to our website at the Raven Foundation, ravenfoundation.org, and thank you for playing for keeps with us.